Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. There you go. Uh, my name is Alan Madden, Gadigal Elder. For my first song, <laughs> born and bred in Redfern, the capital of Sydney. <laughs> Married man. Ten children, 26 grandchildren and 17 great-great. Yes, we did have TV. <laughs> Just couldn't afford the bloody electricity. <laughs> Welcome to country to me is always an honour and pleasure. Just to give you a little bit of an insight of where you are and who we are. To all our Pacifica mob, all mobs, it's always a pleasure to welcome one and all. As with all welcomes, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge our First Nations and traditional owners of the lands that you may have come from or work upon and pay my respects. To all our Aboriginal elders, all elders, past and present, also pay my respects. To all our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters, from whatever Aboriginal or island nation you may have come from, welcome to Gadigal. And to all our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters here this evening, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. No matter where you've come from, whether it be across the seas, across the state or across town, once again, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. And as I've mentioned many times before, was, is, and always will be Aboriginal land. Only three things short than that, coming, taxation and going. It's an honour and pleasure to be here this evening to welcome one and all the Gadigal. Gadigal is one of 29 clans of the Eora Nation. The Eora Nation is bounded by nature's own the Hawkesbury River to the north, the Peen to the west, and George's River to the south. And in between those three mighty rivers is the Eora Nation. And in that nation, there are 29 clans. And the clans land we're on this evening is Gadigal. On behalf of members of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council and of the Gadigal mob, once again, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. There's an old Aboriginal saying out there, and I think it's very appropriate for you, Mobby, this evening. They say, where there's a will, there's relatives. <laughs> and as you travel across these traditional lands and waters, may the spirits of our ancestors guide look over you and keep you safe. So once again, on behalf of the Land Council and of the Gadigal mob, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Alan Madden, for that beautiful welcome to country. Can I also acknowledge this country, Gadi, and the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who we are so grateful to be able to meet and talano on this evening. I acknowledge elders past and present and emerging and pay my respects to them and any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present tonight. Sovereignty was never ceded on this land we now call Australia. Good evening, everyone. My name is Alupi Latukefu, and I am the director of the Edmund Rice Centre for Justice and Community Education. And can I say how honoured we are to be hosting tonight's lecture along with the Australian Association for Pacific Studies and the Australian Museum. Before we continue the official proceedings, a bit of housekeeping. You'll see there are two emergency exits on either side. 
Uh, if we do have an emergency, make your way out to either, and there will be people to help, I understand, guide you to where you need to go in terms of evacuation. There's also, if you need to use the bathroom, which I hope most of you have not have already done, uh, there is a bathroom, I understand, if you walk around, uh, that's uh, under the stairs behind this theatre. So it is, it is a location that's probably the closest uh, bathroom that's there. Tonight's lecture will be followed by a Q&A session before completing the official proceedings at 7.45 p.m. We will be continuing the conversation and network with some light foods and refreshments outside of the lecture, but we'll all have to be out of the museum by 8.45 p.m. on the dot. Uh, that's when the museum will be officially booting us out. <laughs> so, welcome to tonight's Australian Association for Pacific Studies Epeli Hawafa Lecture. Can I acknowledge all of you here tonight, including, I understand Reverend Carissa Suli, uh, are you here tonight? If you are, um, oh, welcome. Uh, Carissa is the incoming president of the Uniting Church in Australia and is the first woman of Pacifica heritage to hold that role, which is an astounding <laughs> achievement. It's a wonderful opportunity for all of us to hear from this year's distinguished Epelia Howoffa lecturer, Reverend James Bhagwan. But before I do, I'd like to introduce, uh, before I introduce uh, Reverend Bhagwan, I will ask Melissa Malu from the Australian Museum, followed by Victoria Sed from the AAPS to say a few words. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Australian Museum. Um, I'm very happy to represent the museum this evening to welcome each and every one of you. Um, first, those who came along for the tour, and um, each and every one of you who are attending the public lecture. It was a sold out um, public lecture and we're very, very happy to partner with, um, with AAPS and the Edmund Rice Centre in um, bringing this to you. Um, when um, Katerina first mentioned and the AAPS um, committee and uh, Alopi mentioned the public lecture, we're very excited because um, we just opened our Once on Moana gallery in October and um, if you seen on one of the walls of the gallery, the quote by Ebelihau Offa that we should not be defined by the smallest of our islands is on that. It was um, part of the inspiration behind the curation of the gallery. So of course, we were more than excited to partner up um, and deliver this lecture this evening. On behalf of um, our CEO and director, Kim McKay, our First Nations director, Laura McBride, our Pacifica team, our Once on Wana gallery team, our Once on Wana Connect um, program. Um, very, very big. Malo um, Elele Bulavinaka, and welcome to the Shirley Museum this evening. Thank you. Bulavinaka, and warm Pacific greetings to everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, first of all, to Uncle Alan Madden for his generous welcome. To country, it is a privilege to be here on unceded Gadigal country tonight. Uh, and thank you to Melissa Malu for your welcome to the museum uh, and for the tours that you and your team led for us earlier today. Uh, the work that you were doing with the stunning One Soul Moana exhibition is remarkable. So my name is Victoria Stead. I'm the current president of the Australian Association for Pacific Studies. Uh, on behalf of our vice president and founding member, uh, Professor Katerina Tiewa, uh, the rest of the AAPS executive, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the ninth Apelli Hawafa Annual Memorial Lecture. So the Apelli Hawafa Annual Memorial Lecture was established by AAPS in 2015. Uh, to honour the incredible legacy of the Tongan scholar, poet and artist Apelli Hawafa. The influence of Hawafa on the field of Pacific studies just cannot be overstated. He offered a vision of the Pacific that was expansive, 
rich, uh, defined, sometimes irreverent, and always deeply interconnected. Against the belittling colonial narratives of Pacific smallness, Hawafa insisted on the breadth and scope of Pacific life and culture, the sea of islands spanning a third of the Earth's surface. So in naming our annual public lecture series after Apeli Hawafa, our association's intention has been to platform and celebrate the many remarkable Pacific scholars and thinkers who are in different ways furthering the vision of the Pacific that Hawafa so powerfully instantiated. We do this in partnership, and this year we are delighted to be partnering both with the Edmund Rice Centre and with the Australian Museum. So I do want to acknowledge again our deep gratitude to the museum for hosting us so generously, uh, including Mel Pugh, I'm not sure where Mel, where Mel is sitting, but who's been an absolute powerhouse. Uh, and I do want to acknowledge also that there are several threads of connection between the museum and the AAPS that have been building over several years. So two of our app's uh, executive members currently, Miles Maniapoto, our website officer, and before him, Stan Florek, uh, have been members of the Australian Museum's Pacific Collections team. And our vice president, Katarina Tiawa, has been involved in an 18-month project with the museum, uh, including as one of the members of the Pacific Curatorium that helped conceptualise the One Sol Moana exhibition. So it's really meaningful for us to be here tonight. And I also extend my thanks to Alopi and the team at the Edmund Rice Centre, uh, including Corinne Farragay, who's just also been uh, stunning in her support um, and organisational wizardry in getting this event off the ground. Um, and that includes tonight's lecture, but also the postgraduate dialogue that Reverend Bhagwan is going to be hosting with some of our PhD and early career researchers tomorrow um, at the ERC venue in Balmain. So my other job for tonight, before I hand back to Alopi, uh, is to announce the winners of the AAPS PhD Prize for 2024. The Tracy Banavanua Ma PhD Prize is named after another deeply influential uh, figure in Pacific studies. Tracy Banavanua Ma was a Pacific historian and a dear friend to many in AAPS. And we award this prize annually to the most outstanding PhD thesis uh, by an APPS student member uh, working in the field of Pacific Studies. The award is made on the basis both of scholarly excellence and alignment with ours and Tracy's vision for a vibrant, critical, creative and decolonial Pacific Studies. The prize was judged this year by two esteemed uh, AAPS colleagues, Dr John Cox and Emeritus Professor Helen Lee, and my thanks to both of them for their work. And I am delighted uh, to announce uh, that this year, uh, the winner of the Tracy Benavenua Ma PhD Prize is Dr Marco de Jong, and that our highly commended awardee is Dr Tima Ima Tavuki. So uh, let me quickly say something first about Dr. Tavuki's thesis. Vatu Day, Indigenous Fijian Psychological Resilience of Itauke Children and Families in Koro, is highly commended for its original contribution to the decolonization of Pacific studies. Focusing on responses to tropical cyclone Winston in Fiji, the, th the thesis reveals the psychological resilience of Itauke children and their families. The judges considered Dr. Tavuki's Indigenous Fijian Psychological Resilience Framework to be an innovative contribution to Indigenous psychology. Dr. Tavuki is currently based in Fiji, uh, but we're delighted to have her principal PhD supervisor, Associate uh, Professor Natea Sawabu, here uh, to collect her award on her behalf. Um, Katerina is going to, uh, to present the awards. Mateo, if you'd like to come up, please, and accept this on Tima's behalf. <laughs> uh, 
And then Dr. De Jong's work, a winning thesis for 2024. Kotahe Timoana, Only One Ocean, Pacific Environmentalism, 1970 to 1995. Uh, the judges were in agreement that this is an outstanding thesis. It richly develops the idea of Pacific environmentalism to provide a new perspective on the early days of regional concerns with the environment and how these were linked to the global environmental movement and international organisations like the UN. Based on oral history and archival work undertaken across the Pacific, this beautifully written thesis carefully avoids essentializing Pacific environmentalism, recognizing differences across the region, changes over time, and the dangers of imposing stereotypes. Dr. De Jong also addresses the future of Pacific history as a discipline, centering indigenous Pacific concepts, voices, and knowledges in powerful ways. So we're absolutely thrilled that Marco could be here today to accept this award in person. Marco, if you'd like to join us. And finally, I do want to sincerely congratulate all of the submissions for this year's prize, which were just of an incredibly high standard. I had the pleasure of reading all of the submitted theses alongside our judges, and it was a delight to see the creative, rigorous, vital work that is being done at the forefront of Pacific Studies. And on that very happy note, uh, I'm going to pass back now to Alopi Latukefu to introduce our lecturer for this evening, the Reverend James Bugwan. Uh, before I introduce Reverend Bugwan, I it would be remiss of me to not talk a little bit about the Edmund Rice Centre for Justice and Community Education. Uh, we are a social justice and human rights focused organisation based in Balmain and have been around since 1996 and you'll see this on some of the coasters that you would have been handed. Uh, over the last 28 years we have had a focus on First Nations reconciliation and self-determination, refugees and people seeking asylum's rights, as well as the issue of climate change and climate justice within the Pacific. We are an organisation that has built its reputation on deep listening, advocacy and providing platforms to invest in emerging leaderships and amplifying the voices of those we walk in solidarity and alongside in the pursuit of social justice. Tonight's Epeli Hawafa lecture is a case in point. And can I say how honoured I am personally to have the opportunity to introduce this year's lecturer on a lecture named after someone who I knew from a very young age, not only as a great scholar, but part of my extended family in Papua New Guinea and Fiji. Epeli was of a generation younger than my father, but both were committed to having the voice of the Pacific heard in the telling of our history, in academia, but also the many other aspects of what matters to our oceanic region. And one of the great things about Epeli was the fact that he had this view of the region based on his lived experience in Papua New Guinea along with being a Tongan, along with being most of his career in Fiji. And that was something which he brought to his work and you can hear it and see it in all of what he did. So if you would like to support the work of the center, just quickly you can by scanning the QR code and I won't go any more of that. <laughs> Born and raised in Fiji and ordained minister of the Methodist Church in Fiji, Reverend James Sri Bhagwan has just been appointed as General Secretary of the Pacific Conference of Churches for a further term. The PCC is Oceania's region's peak ecumenical organization with 35 member churches, 11 national councils of churches, and from 19 Pacific Island countries and territories, including Aotearoa and the land now called Australia. A practicing ecumenist, Reverend Bhagwan is also licensed, I understand, to preach and celebrate the sacraments in the Anglican Diocese of Polynesia. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Divinity in Ecumenical Studies with honours from the Pacific Theological College, a Master of Theology 
in Christian social ethics and the Methodist theological from the Methodist Theological University in Seoul, South Korea, and hopes to eventually finish his PhD when he can make, can make the time to do it. Uh, <laughs> Reverend Bhagwan is a multifaceted visionary, blending spiritual leadership with grassroots activism to catalyze positive change. Throughout his career, he has championed numerous causes from environmental stewardship to human rights advocacy, including in West Papua. He is a vocal advocate for marginalized communities amplifying their voices on a local, regional, and global stage. As a thought leader, he inspires transformative dialogue and action. His insightful teachings resonate deeply, challenging individuals and institutions alike to confront systemic injustices and embrace inclusivity. Beyond theory, he leads by example, rolling up his sleeves to engage in hands-on initiatives that foster tangible change. From community development projects to interfaith collaborations, Reverend Bhagwan's brand of servant leadership is rooted in empathy and solidarity. Along with all that, he is a dedicated family man, an avid stand-up paddler, and a volunteer crew member, chaplain, and trustee of the Fijian voyaging canoe the Uto Niyalo, and I think there's a photo of uh, Reverend Bhagwan that was part of the advertising for this year's uh, lecture, where he's heavily involved in coastal and ocean marine protection. In a world hungering for hope, he stands as a beacon of possibility, inspiring individuals and communities to join hands in building a more just, equitable, and compassionate world. So without further ado, can I introduce this year's 2024, Epeli Hawafa Lecturer, the Right Reverend Padre James Bhagwan. Oh, Walla Colin. Uh, may I begin by acknowledging the Vanua of Gadigal and uh, acknowledging that we are not only on unceded land, but we are in the midst of many unheard voices as we reflect on uh, the referendum last year. But uh, let me also give my appreciation to uh, the AAPS, the Edmund Rice Centre, the Australian Museum, and all the people putting this wonderful gathering together. And thank you, everyone, for showing up um, this evening. Thank you, Bevik, for the lovely setting. And to um, Joseph for not eating the <laughs> decorations. Um, I also want to acknowledge the person after whom this lecture is named, Ipeli Haofa. And although I never had the chance to meet him in person, I had his wife, Barbara, as my English teacher who got me into public speaking. So if you don't like what I say, blame her. <laughs> May her soul rest in peace, and of course went to school with uh, Ipeli Jr. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge my dresses for today, uh, Maylin and Antonia, my wife and daughter, who told me, wear work clothes, don't work wear your Climate Warriors t-shirt. So sorry again, Joseph, but uh, next time. I... Um, I said to, uh, and I'll say it again to Alopi, uh, please can you send me a copy of that for my eulogy when I die? That's how perhaps I'd like to be remembered. But um, it's, it's quite strange for me to be referred to as a lecturer, uh, or giving a lecture. The last formal lecture I gave was around 2010 at the Davi Levu <laughs> Methodist Theological College. And the last informal lecture was to the, my son the other day, reminding him how to balance uh, work, music, and social life uh, as an accountant who is really secretly, or very publicly, a musician as well. But in my tradition, may I just begin by saying, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart and each of our hearts tonight be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My talano this evening begins with uh, three words, which we find in the last paragraph of Ipeli Haofa's seminal work, Our Sea of Islands. Oceania 
is us. One early morning during the COVID-19 lockdowns of 2020 in Suva, I was awakened by the roar of waves breaking on the reef. In the imposed silence of a curfew, the rhythmic sound traveled from the reef almost three kilometers away to my living room where I was sleeping because it was hot. It was the sound of power, the power of a primordial force that has ebbed and flowed since before our islands were mythically fished out, before the peaks and highlands emerged in fire and smoke. And that morning, as soon as the curfew was over and I could get out of the confines of our COVID-19 created islands for physically distance exercise, I paddled out in the pre-dawn light to the sound of the elemental roar that I had woken up to. And don't worry about the pictures, that's just in case you get bored of looking at my face. As the sun emerged from the horizon and began its journey, I knelt on my board and observed in awe the swells from the dark blue ocean hitting the reef and rolling into the lagoon. And I recalled the favorite saying of my now late friend, Captain Jonathan Smith, the first skipper of Fiji's traditional voyaging icon, the Utunialo, who said, the sea has no love, no mercy, no compassion. The more a person goes to sea, the greater respect they have for it. The ocean is a powerful elemental force, and it is to be respected. But likewise, Oceania is to be respected. It is a power that has not yet reached its peak. It is a power that has been glimpsed in the use of celestial navigation, the design and sailing of huge ocean-going double-hull canoes across a blue continent millennia before those who could wander into the Solwara, the Moana, Pacifica, and discover us. A power glimpsed also when our Pacifica elders, youth, politicians, civil society, scientists, and churches come together to form a unique coalition to stand and hold the red line of 1.5 degrees at cop after cop after cop against wave after wave after wave of climate injustice, balancing the vulnerability of the life of our island communities and the resilience that comes from indigenous knowledge and wisdom, cultures of reciprocity and spirituality that acknowledges our deep connection with creation, the land, the sea, and the sky. The ocean is the great humbler. I experience it every time I try to surf and come off my paddleboard. But I have seen esteemed leaders of thought and spirituality Virile youth, full of strength and energy, reduced to cargo, lying on the deck of a voyaging canoe, trying to remember to vomit downwind as we sail from Suva to Kandavu in Fiji, or to the Lao group, or to my motherland of Vanuelevo. I remember my first solo stand-up paddle outside the reef from Makaluva Island Passage to Nukumbodo Sandbank Passage. Standing on my board, I was literally on the surface of the ocean, not on, up on a deck of a ship or on the deck of the Utunialo or a ferry. And the Suva coast and skyline were disappearing behind rolling ocean swells that towered over me one moment and raised me up to the sky the next. None of my roles, none of my titles, status in church or community or academic qualifications mattered in that moment. I was an insignificant creature on a fancy piece of styrofoam, just trying to ride the waves, trying to ride the current, and trying to find my way back inside the lagoon, which is my safe space. I'm actually surprised that I had time to think during that almost 45 minute long, six kilometer paddle outside the reef. The intensity of focus that was required led me to a hyper-consciousness of time, my thoughts sparking and fading almost inst instantaneously. I all but cursed 
the spirits of my dearly departed friends, Skipper Jonathan Smith and Colin Philp, whose voices I was so sure I had heard moments ago, telling me as I scanned the sky and the ocean to judge the conditions to go beyond the reef. And I wondered what of those of my great-grandparents who were brought to Fiji in that great British colonial enterprise of modern slavery, the indenture system, what they must have thought about the waves, the winds, and the rolling seas. They were isolated from the land they had called Dhartima, Mother Earth, the Indian subcontinent, crossing the Kalapani or the black waters, which meant that they lost relationship with land, with identity, with status and caste. They were casteless, even lower than the lowest caste. I remember my father, my late father, a Methodist lay preacher and in Fijian, a Tuirara Levu, a divisional chief steward in the Methodist church, among other Christian leadership roles, telling me of how his father's father, an inland fisherman or machua from the river Rapti in uh, the Uttar Pradesh, had brought their ancestral spirit, what in Itoke language, uh, Fiji we call Kolovu, from India to Fiji in the form of a giant fish. And as I paddled, I wondered, was this a fish? Was this a shark? Was it something more metaphysical? My daughter, as a little child, told me of the ocean creature that she would often see when she was out on a boat or looking out from shore. Had I told her this story? Was she seeing what I didn't see? There were moments when the reef and the coast were obscured by these ocean mountains. And I hoped, rather than prayed, that Jesus might appear walking on the water to guide me to the next passage in the reef. Or maybe my ancestors, Kolovu, whatever it was, might guide me. In the end, it was the familiar landmarks that I have used in the past when paddling in conditions where visibility is limited. The 20 meter tall Angel Moroni atop the Suva Fiji Temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the still incomplete WG Friendship Plaza, the tower that is the bane of the Suva skyline, that perhaps represents the next strategy of the Belt Road initiative takers. The ocean above is rolling waves that rise and fall. It is squalls, strong breezes, and periods of dead calm. The ocean below is a huge interconnected ecosystem, currents regulating the temperature of the planet. The ocean is phytoplankton that absorb carbon dioxide and transform it into oxygen that is 50 to 70% of what we need to live. As I often say, one breath from the seas and the other breath from the trees. The ocean is traditionally designed and sailed canoes that have traversed the region, sailing the equivalent of three times round the planet, celebrating ancient knowledge and wisdom that is part of the equation of the formula to save our planet. The ocean is rich in unique biodiversity. The ocean is life. The ocean is alive. Yet the ocean is also king tides, storm surges which drown coasts and atolls. The ocean is also massive fleets of fishing vessels and vessels of war. The ocean is the final frontier for exploitation and extraction. The ocean is floating shipments of methamphetamine and cocaine, awaiting pickup from local fishermen who's out of work because all the fish are being taken. Perhaps the ocean is literally becoming the Kalapani, the black water, choking in radioactive waste of the equivalent of 9,000 Hiroshimas, spreading from Mauhinui, Kirisimas, and Kiribati, the Marshall Islands, and even here in the land now called Australia choking on waste from Fukushima. The ocean is choking on plastic, a fossil fuel product. It is choking from boots of hypermilitarization, lovingly pressed down in the toxic relationship of the soft and hard power that is a new Cold War. For me, these images are representative of the Oceania, the Pacifica, the one Solwara, the Pacific household of God. 
and the promises she holds and the challenges she faces. They serve as a reminder to pay attention to the currents, to pay attention to the winds of change, and that there is a big difference between what is on the surface and what is really happening beneath. This understanding of Oceania is to illustrate that issues are often more complex and multidimensional than many would prefer to articulate. Most perspectives of regional issues tend to focus at the high level, at the political implications, excluding the voices of the community. And there is a need for a critical attitude towards the narratives, text, countertext, subtext, pretext, context, and deeper text, which is necessary in order to understand the facts in terms of a wider truth, balance in terms of attention to all goals of all parties, people as well as elites, and deciding what perspectives promote conflict or promote peace. And so I'm very enheartened to see the two recipients or the recipient, Dr. De Jong and uh, Dr. Timaima, tonight and what they have been working on. For the past few months, I have been reflecting on this term Indo-Pacific. And as someone with uh, strong Indian ancestry, as you've heard, 84% according to Ancestry.com, <laughs> my DNA, but raised in the Pacific and married to someone with Chinese, Fijian, Irish, Welsh, Ikiribas, Samoan, and again to the DNA people of Ancestry.com, Tongan and Maori ancestry, <laughs> our children are definitely Indo-Pacific, which is much better sounding than Blackanese, which they used to use to describe themselves. And therefore, while my dearly beloved and patient wife and I do discuss specific issues at the dinner table, often an Indo-Pacific strategy is just really the management of our household and our kids, well, the newly adulted fruit of our loins. In all seriousness, as people who have been impacted by such geopolitical contestations for the last two and a half centuries, there is a need to pay attention to this latest wave. And as Wesley Morgan puts it, a tendency to view the Pacific Ocean as a maritime theater of competition is not a new phenomenon. For centuries, major powers have struggled for naval supremacy in the Pacific. Pacific Islanders have seen the Spanish, British, French, Dutch, Germans, Japanese, and Americans all vie for control of their ocean. And these contexts have indelibly marked the region, none more so than World War II. In the decades following the war, strategic thinkers continued to view the islands through the lens of a maritime power projection. Well, what's new today? Post-World War II, the Cold War, and neocolonialism was the form of economic globalization, as well as each successive wave that has continued to exploit and extract, albeit in different styles, there has always been a denial or active suppression of the agency of Pacific people for the Pacific. There is a constant renaming or refashioning of patron-client politics. Relationships are still transactional. Today, communism has been swapped with the Belt Road Initiative. But the premise of defense of the Pacific for the current world order is still the same a new Cold War under the name of the Indo-Pacific strategy. Perhaps even AUKUS can be seen as a reboot of ANZUS. And what my friend Wesley calls aqua nullius, to describe the Pacific Islands through the lens of maritime competition, which in turn exacerbates the tendency to see Pacific Islands as small and isolated, as pawns in a great naval game, has also been described as marinulus in the context of resource extraction in the high seas, in denial of the fact that the ocean, unlike on land, impacts under the sea are transboundary. The Pacific people's understanding of place and space, of the land-sea continuity, and in the words of Dame Meg Taylor, uttered in this Talonor space, not in this space, but in the lecture last year, reach from the highlands to the high seas. 
And as the Pacific Regional NGO Alliance has previously stated, the blue economy narrative is a scramble to control the Pacific Ocean and its natural resources through a second wave of economic and pol political colonization, a blue colonization. The imposition of the blue-green economy and the inadvertent territorialization of oceans for geopolitical and economic gain have found confounded valuable efforts to protect critical life-giving ecosystems and rebuild and promote long-term ocean health and integrity to sustain life for generations to come. Dame Meg has articulated much on the Indo-Pacific, not just at last year's Ipeli Hawafa Memorial Lecture, or Talano, to hell with drowning, but also during her tenure as Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, where in our interactions I had the honor of learning from her wisdom. And she continues to do so now as a Pacific elder. There are a number of Indo-Pacific strategies which are really just an excuse for what the Pacific Network on Globalization has termed enduring colonization. France's Indo-Pacific considerations paint China as the villain and thus the reason why it cannot allow Maui Nui and Kaneki, currently known as French Polynesia and New Caledonia, to become independent. It's for their protection. However, as Nick McClellan points out, France gains seven million square kilometers of exclusive economic zone from its Pacific territories. And as a French uh, state report noted in 2014, 10 years ago, present in both hemispheres and at all points of the compass, the French EEZ is the only one on which the sun never sets. There was another empire on which the sun never set. <laughs> Nick also points out that the French Indo-Pacific strategy does not interest Kanak and Maui communities and leaders who seek political self-determination to claim their place in the Pacifica household. And last year, the Pacific Conference of Churches General Assembly was held in Kanaki as a celebration of that fact, as a resistance to the ongoing colonization and a call for what we call dokamo, the Kanak word, for transformation, the human being in permanent becoming. Although set against the backdrop of the past three decades, the image of Ipeli Hawafa's Sea of Islands has served to counter the neo-colonial view of the Pacific as small island developing states with an alternative, celebrating the large liquid continent of Oceania celebrating indigenous wisdom, science, and economics. And it is a term and a concept still used by theologians, anthropologists, and development specialists, and historians. It is used in self-determination. It is a protest chant, a cry that is as loud as we are not drowning, we are fighting. It is used in Pacific ecumenism, articulated in the Pacific Church's ecumenical concept of the Pacifica household of God, which includes not only all people, but all creation. It is used in Pacific regionalism with the articulation of the blue Pacific continent. It is also in danger of corporate and political capture, which unless resisted, will re either reduce it to just rhetoric or brownwashing, or militarization. The Indo-Pacific strategy is a direct challenge to the concept of the Blue Pacific Continent, to the Sea of Islands, to Oceania. It is counter to the vision of self-determination for Oceania, for the Blue Pacific that the Pacific Island countries, leaders, and ultimately its people hope to have. Perhaps the Pacific Island Forum leader's adoption of a vision for a zone of peace or an ocean of peace at last year's meeting in the Cook Islands is a step towards protecting Pacific concepts such as the Blue Pacific from being captured by geopolitical and geoeconomic interests. And as many of you know, this has been championed by the Prime Minister of Fiji, Sitiveni Rambuka, 
He's going through his own journey, <laughs> historical journey, other journeys, reconciliation. But who has been reflecting on this for some time. And I recall leading the devotion when he was traditionally welcomed by the Fijian Ministry for Foreign Affairs as its line minister in January last year. Because at that event, he was already showing in the in, the in, an interest in peace building in the context of bringing Kiribati back into the Pacific Islands Forum, which he undertook not using Western diplomacy, but using traditional indigenous Fijian protocols to seek forgiveness and restoration of relationship. The ocean of peace seems to be a Fijian foreign policy and a regional articulation of Mr. Rambuka's key campaign message immediately prior to the 2022 election campaign to let love shine, which confused many in the diplomatic field. <laughs> and I was doing a lot of interpretation <laughs> on that. But for those of us who have worked very hard to ensure that when the thematic area of security was being introduced into the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific continent, quite late in the game, during all those formal, informal, informal, formal meetings that we were having, we made sure that it was termed peace and security and included non-traditional security issues. And so, the concept of peace can be a welcome alternative to the militarized language around security. Prime Minister Rambuka has said that an aim of the zone of peace is to ensure peace and multilateral cooperation in the Pacific in the face of geopolitical rivalries. And that's an interesting concept, concept particularly when spoken about in terms of the challenge that Pacific Island countries face in having to balance the power by the players in the Indo-Pacific geopolitical chess game. Yet it's important that when we look at the zone of peace concept, that it's not limited to traditional peace and security, but also to consider the non-traditional aspects of peace and security, such as well-being. In fact, speaking to the ABC in October last year, Prime Minister Rambuka articulated a vision of the zone of peace as a spiritual approach. And yes, we got phone calls after that too. But one that resonates with concepts such as the island of hope and the Pacifica household of God, recognizing that the phrase vuvale means more than family. It means household. In Greek, oikos, the root word for economy, ecology, and ecumenicity. And so I'd like to spend the rest of my time tonight trying to unpack and perhaps articulate what an ocean of peace might look like. What would a true ocean of peace mean for our region? How can it bring about the well-being of people who seek to flourish amongst the many challenges that they are facing? We, talk, we hear talk about the survival of the Pacific. I think that's not good enough. Pacific people deserve to flourish not just survive. A notion of peace in the context of climate change was articulated at a recent gathering of civil society organizations working for climate justice in the Pacific, who envisioned a fossil fuel free Pacific that is the result of a just transition from the use of fossil fuels. This call underscores the key Moore report released last year which outlines the pathways for a fossil fuel free Pacific and highlighted that the upfront estimated cost of replacing all existing fossil fuel electricity generation in Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Samoa, Kiribati, Federated States of Micronesia and Tuvalu ranges from 691 million USD to just over a billion USD depending on the specific technology mix which is going to be used. But that one billion US dollars is only one seventh of the amount of money that Australia gave to the fossil fuel industry in handouts and tax breaks in 2022-2023. And less than half a percent of the huge profits that the world's top five fossil fuel companies 
made last year alone. In envisioning a fossil fuel future for the Pacific, the Nauli Declaration takes its name from the indigenous Fijian word for the steering oar, English rudder, of the Ndrua, the traditional twin-hulled ocean voyaging canoe. The declaration carries the twin aspects of vulnerability and resilience. There is the vulnerability of communities facing an existential crisis caused by climate change, with livelihood, community, culture, deep spiritual relationship with land and ocean all at risk of being lost, and the potential for climate-induced displacement. But there is also the resilience of our Pacific people, rooted in their traditional indigenous wisdom and practice of living in harmony with creation, as we hear in these lands walking gently on the earth. And this is strengthened with their Christian faith, which in the face of unsustainable development and a global culture of extractivism, is a prophetic voice of a counter-narrative to the current blue and greenwashing of the fossil fuel industry. As the Pacific climate warrior Suluafi Brianna Fruin states, a fossil fuel free Pacific is not only the dream for the future, but a memory of the past. But how do we create the conditions for a fossil fuel free Pacific? How do we ensure that there is truly a just and equitable transition that benefits our local communities and our local industries? How do we ensure that for those whom the ocean is a highway and a source of livelihood, that they can travel gently on the waves with low carbon sustainable sea transport? What is the ecological conversion required within our oceans of peace to help wean us off unsustainable lifestyles and business practices that have been thrust upon us? The ocean of peace will require what the Pacific Theological College calls the restoring of the Pacifica household, a rethinking of development and a reweaving of the ecological mat. The first steps of this process were taken at the dawn of this century as the island of hope, which recognized that while Western economics revolved around profit and economic growth, traditional economies of the Pacific are concerned with people and the total quality of their lives, caring and concern for others within the extended families and compassion for all people, especially the sick, the elderly, and these are values of the communities, respect, hospitality, generosity, and forgiveness are other marks of the traditional communities. The Itoke name for this is Sole Solevaki. Nobody is excluded. The land, the sea, and the people are integral parts of one entity. Subsistence farming, sustainable agriculture, and the sensitivity of the sacredness of the trees and the sea are part of their identity. Taken in this concept, or in this context, and this model, the ocean of peace would be a region in tune with nature and by sharing and caring to which all people want to journey in order to celebrate life in all its fullness. The ocean of peace would have the mana, the power to draw human beings together. The ocean of peace would be sustainable, wholesome, peaceful, and all embracing. I'm sure that many of you in this room may be aware with the more recent attempt to change the story of development that has been the Reweaving the Ecological Mat Project. Led by the Institute of Mission and Research of the Pacific Theological College, this project has been redefining the development narrative, rethinking sustainable development, and proposing an ecological development framework. And in particular, I acknowledge the role of Reverend Professor Upolu Lumavai, the PTC principal, the Institute of Mission and Research, Isaki Casimira, as well as the sterling work of Reverend Dr. Cliff Bird of the Solomon Islands, the brainchild behind the economic or ecological framework for development. Beyond the 2050 strategies recognition of the indigenous knowledge and wisdom, the REM project affirms that indigenous and Christian religious ecological frameworks of knowledge, ethics, and practices can contribute to much to addressing the ecological crises of today. Both Vai and Casimira and colleagues at 
PTC, have been working on decolonizing development from a Pacifica whole of life perspective, developing communities-based education models and a promotion of a Pacifica consciousness as the entry point for development education and policy. And Bird has been working on developing well-being indicators that measure what development means at a Pacific community level. Lots of resonances with the two awards today. From a conservation and ocean guardianship perspective, a true ocean of peace is not only for human beings, but for all the region's biodiversity. Sustainable fishing practices, a ban on deep sea mining, and an ecocide law, among other things, led by traditional indigenous and local community leadership and integrated spirituality. And in this regard, I'd like to acknowledge the indigenous leaders of Aotearoa, Mauhinui, and the Cook Islands, who have, in just this past week, signed a treaty that recognizes whales as legal persons. Much more work to be done, but it's a start. The ocean of peace is in itself an act of self-determination for Pacific Islanders to place the political, social, cultural, economic, ecological, physical, mental, and spiritual well-being of their communities at the forefront of the re regional discourses on development, regionalism, and geopolitics. And that's what Vi and others mean by whole of life. And here perhaps lies the greatest challenge to the ocean of peace concept. Because this work is not for little lagoons of peace, but a whole ocean of peace. This ocean of peace requires strong multilateral regional commitment to the blue Pacific continent, in which all communities, all states, all people are treated equally. Commitments to the Rarotonga Treaty for a nuclear-free Pacific and respect to the quest to the region's long-standing quest for nuclear justice the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons must be made by those who seek to be friends of the Pacific and seek to enter into the ocean of peace, particularly states responsible for nuclear testing in the Pacific who still need to take the responsibility for their legacy of destruction and commit to equitable reparations. At the same time, we must acknowledge that the struggle over the last 60 years has been for a nuclear-free and independent Pacific. And this will challenge the ocean of peace concept to ensure that the people who are struggling to claim the right to self-determination are able to do so and claim their place and dive deeply into this ocean of peace. Videos circulated two weeks ago of the now acknowledged sadistic torture of a young indigenous West Papuan man is unfortunately only the latest in a very long list of acts of brutality, racism, and violent human rights abuses and oppression of the indigenous Melanesian Pacific Islander people of Tana Papua or West Papua. That is, if not officially sanctioned policy, then accepted behavior by Indonesia's security forces. And what is more disturbing is the selective outrage of those who champion human rights democracy towards those on the other side of the Indo-Pacific fence, but ignore what is happening within it. The Pacific Conference of Churches has called for the suspension, if not expulsion, of Indonesia from the Melanesian Spearhead Group if they do not agree to facilitate the much overdue human rights visit to West Papua. At the same time, recent protests in Kanaki with the failure of the New Mayor Accord over a disputed third referendum and the current postponement by the French Parliament of local and New Caledonian Assembly and Government while it looks to change voter registration laws for French migrants raise further questions of how we can be friends and partners with those who actively and openly subvert the aspirations of the first peoples of Pacific Islands. And there, perhaps, lies the rub. So I think I've done so well without preaching tonight. <laughs> An ocean of peace should mean flourishing for all the communities of Oceania. An ocean of peace could support visa-free travel, particularly for the tens of thousands who works in other parts of the Pacifica household, 
for the benefit of receiving countries and sending countries as well as those who would need to safely relocate with dignity because of climate change without compromising their dignity, their identity, their culture, or their sovereignty. A notion of peace would provide the litmus test of whether the 2050 strategy delivers what it promises on political leadership and regionalism, people-centered development, peace and security, resources and economic development, climate change and disasters, ocean and environment, technology and connectivity. What will an ocean of peace mean for the foreign and domestic policies of our region? What will it mean for a First Nations foreign policy if the self-determination of First Nations is not supported domestically? Of course, a notion of peace must also mean the flourishing of diverse and local communities, some of whom who have faced ethnic and other forms of discrimination. And this is where we need to ensure that we move beyond the rhetoric of these terms and policies and phrases which can so easily be captured by political and corporate interests. And perhaps I would like to propose it means diving deeper from a head-only exercise to a heart exercise that adds the voices of communities, indigenous practitioners, wisdom holders, and teachers, women, youth, children, elders, people often marginalized, and not just policy makers and policy writers. This means going beyond workshops and consultations to engage in Talanoa in its truest form, at national level, at community level, and perhaps even at family level. It needs to ensure that those involved in the work of peacemaking and peace building are brought into the conversation, not just those who do peacekeeping. And it also needs investment, not only in national cohesion, but also regional cohesion. Our planet is running out of time. A history will continue to repeat itself, but in a downward spiral. But our region, Oceania, the ocean of peace is both the most vulnerable, but has the greatest gifts to offer to the world from our indigenous spirituality, our knowledge, our wisdom, to the understanding that peace, that salam, shalom, bula sotu, well-being, fullness of life, abundance and flourishing for all is the right of every creature on this planet. And that communities must be allowed to develop and progress at the speed and at the level that they wish to do, in the way in which they wish to do, and in ways in which indigenous knowledge, wisdom, and culture is celebrated. Development models in the Pacific, in our ocean of peace, do not have to match the image and likeness set by the global north. Development must be based in our Pacifica understandings of community and relationship with the environment, well-being of the community, not gross domestic product. Not profit needs to be the indicator for Pacific development. It must not shy away from spirituality. It must not shy away from reciprocity and hospitality. And it must counter fear of scarcity with abundance of love. Velomani. As I look around the room tonight, well, I did earlier when the lights were on, as I looked around the room, I am grateful for your presence to hear what this slightly irreverent reverend has to say. But I'm also grateful to see those who are of the Pacifica household, those who have committed themselves to be the guardians and protectors of our liquid continent. And so tonight I pay tribute to you, as well as those who do so from our island homes and our island communities. The ocean of peace, the Oceania of peace, must be embodied by us. And for me, that's what I mean by the ocean is us. It's the only way in which the mana, the energy of our moana, our white dui, our solwara, can transform our region. Just as the ocean transforms all of our carbon dioxide that is choking the planet into oxygen that gives life. But if the ocean, if our region is to be a peaceful place, it must begin with us being at peace. 
And here I want to talk about the fact that well-being is both communal and personal. Mental health is one of the most ignored issues in the Pacific. And this is where I see spiritual health as part of the mental and physical health, the whole human being. And again, I know this is not a midweek church gathering, but we must recognize that the health of our souls affects our relationship with one another. And that love has been excluded from the development, peace and security, climate conversations for too long. Because we care for what we love. We protect what we love. We fight for what we love. And I'm reminded of the words of Cornel West, justice is what love looks like in the public space. Love overcomes fear, and if fear leads to insecurity, then love is a tool for peace building. Loving oneself, loving others, loving the environment. And so if we are to have an ocean of peace, we must be at peace. We must work for peace. The flourishing of life for the people of the Pacific, for all the people of the Pacific, and all that exists in our Pacifica household, on land and in the ocean. God bless you. Don't go anywhere, James. Uh, we are opening up uh, to a few questions. Uh, so we'll, we'll go for another uh, 10 or so minutes. Uh, so if there are any questions from the floor, uh, I might, uh, if we got the mic there, we might actually see if people can actually use the mic on the floor so that uh, you can, we can hear your question, if you have a question. You can raise your hand. Well, I might, start, I might start with a question, James, because I was very struck by your speech. Uh, the uh, Pacific is a vast place, and the challenges are equally as vast. Yeah. And I wonder how, how, do we, how do we come not only to dealing with climate change, but also dealing with uh, major power rivalry with human rights issues? What, what comes first? How do, we, how do we take on all these challenges in our region? And I, I'd be just keen on your thoughts, given, given the lecture, on what you see as, well, a way to navigate this vast, complex set of issues that we're facing. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to remember that uh, we don't all have to do the same thing. I, I, I learn a lot from the stories of our um, traditional voyaging canoes and their history and what we're trying to do over the last 10, 15 years, particularly. And you know, it's 10 years this year when the fleet of four canoes from uh, Fiji, Samoa, Cook Islands, and Aotearoa came into Darling Harbor as part of the uh, World Parks Congress. But we sail as fleets, and we don't all have to sail the same way in the same place, but we sail in the same direction. So the issue here is justice. Justice in terms of climate justice, justice in terms of human rights abuse, justice in terms of ecological issues, et cetera, et cetera, nuclear justice. And there is enough of us to do the work. What we tend to lack is collaboration. And I think that's an important space. And I really want to challenge us that we need to come out of our comfort zones of the different spaces in which we work and do our work. Uh, you know, the academic and the faith need to work together. The faith and the science. Uh, all the different civil society organizations. We all have our role to play and we all just, we find it so hard sometimes to see people sitting down and working together because we all want to protect our various brandings and everything else, with all due respect. Uh, you know, sometimes Joseph uh, and I don't see each other for months, except on Instagram. But when the Climate Warriors, when Caritas and others, and all the different groups, Greenpeace, everybody, when we rock up to a COP meeting, even if we haven't 
had the time to plan before we come together. The governments come together, the civil society, the science, the uh, environmental people all come together and work together. Now imagine if we were doing that before, if there was that opportunity for people to work together. And so I want to encourage us in the different fields to reach out to those in that space. Don't wait to be approached, because I think that's also an aspect of fear. We don't want to be rejected when we reach out. But that's the only way we're going to work together. And that's why for us as the Pacific Conference of Churches, ecumenism is so important, because it focuses on recognizing that we are part of a family, a household, and that there's different work for different groups to do, but we do it together. Just don't talk about how much grog we're going to drink. <laughs> Uh, it's an honor uh, to address you as the, the descendants of the Lubendrana Ratu, uh, something that uh, I think uh, we're all proud of. Uh, really, really inspired by your talk. Uh, not to burst the bubble and the energy. Uh, Padre, I just wonder the zone of peace that you've discussed. Uh, you've talked about Mr. Rambuka. Very lovely to hear. Let love shine. Um, and also, all of the discussions of human rights abuses in, in the various aspects of it. How do we reconcile that as, as a Fijian, as an Oceanian, as being part of the zone of peace or the ocean of peace, with the issues on, on which Fiji in itself has stood mm. by the abuses in Palestine? Um, I, 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 I'm, I was reflecting on this before coming here, thinking about it because of all of these discussions. And of course, we have a very strong sense of who we are, that we should flourish. How do we reconcile that? I, I, I wonder, do you think that Fiji has had such a strong love affair with secularism that we've, or a superficial form of secularism, that we've become obsessed with religiosity versus spirituality? Um, could you help me understand that, uh, Turang Nita? Nah. Give me two years after I finish my <laughs> role, write the PhD. But that's what I, actually, that's what my, when I was doing a PhD, we can talk more about that tomorrow. That's what I was focusing on, where we went off track and started shifting from spirituality to religiosity. And that, unfortunately, was when colonial Australia started bringing that sense of things. Somebody's fault, it's always somebody's fault. But I think, I mean, we're living in a world now where because of technology, we are hyper-connected. And that's great for transmitting ideas, good ideas, but it's also really bad for transmitting bad ideas. And um, I just saw a, 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 a flyer for the Presbyterian Church of the United States in the United States doing a series of webinars on Christian Zionism. So there's a lot of factors at play here. And uh, I think also, particularly for Fiji, after 15 years of imposed uh, secularism, there is an opening and there's been a mad rush for churches or faith perspectives to get in. And sometimes the right voice is not the loudest voice, yeah? or the loudest voice is not the right voice. But I think there is a journey that we're on as a nation. And Things like that, the, the focus on Israel rather than Palestine, which is not just Muslim, but Christian, you know. Uh, and I was at the World Council of Churches uh, Commission, on, uh, Church, Commission of Churches on International Affairs where we were grappling with this. Uh, it's not unique to Fiji, although Fiji, you know, uh, took that stand. But I think un unraveling and going to the root cause of some of these issues is the journey that we need to get on. Uh, thank you for acknowledging me as Luvendra Naratu, as your neta. And that's one of the stories where a Fijian chief out of his faith says to the descendants of indentured laborers, not only are you part of my community, but you're part of my household. I take you, I ask my high chief to give you a name, children of the chief. And what that means for people who had their identity, dignity, everything stripped, is very, very powerful. And that's the kind of thing that we can start to work towards. Uh, hi, my name is Elijah. Um, I'm the one someone uh, connect officer here at uh, the Australian Museum for the Pacifica Department. Um, 
nakwalevuna nomni vivasi mai totoko vagotsi totoko vagotsi nomni mai um i work with a lot of youth and a lot of engagement with our pacifica communities here in sydney and a common theme i've come across in terms of um climate change and, and environmental issues in the pacific amongst pacific islanders here in sydney is there's really a massive gap of them not really knowing what's going on or not even being aware of what climate change or what that actually looks like. Um, my team and I are really trying to work on to change that, that perspective and that narrative, but I'm interested to, to hear your thoughts of what perhaps are some things that we could do um, to assist. I'm not saying we're gonna change the world or anything, but- Why not? You know. <laughs> Why not? We can change. At least so. something uh, we can do to kind of make tackle this uh, this issue. Nak. Yeah, I think you've got people in the front row already who can do that work, uh, doing that work. I think that's what I'm talking about. Then there needs to be a little bit more collaboration in different spaces, and uh, the role of the church in our Pacifica communities is one. The role of the Pacific Island councils is another. And we work with both of these in this space, and I think that's something we can do in terms of sharing information and telling stories. But encouraging people to reconnect back home and see what's happening. Uh, because it's not just an issue for the Pacific, it's an issue for Australia, it's an issue for the whole world. And uh, if they are disconnected, that's another issue, how we reconnect, knowing that the Pacific that their parents or grandparents left is not the Pacific of today, knowing that they have multiple identities that they need to negotiate. But I think there is really a need for us to tell more stories and encourage our young people, which is the largest demographic in the Pacific, under 30. Uh, and we need to not, I mean, empower them and, 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 and you know, engage, but not burden them, because they still need to live and be young people. Huh? Look at Joseph, he was, uh, he was a happy young person at one stage. <laughs> Oh, hello, I'm Jill Fanane and I am retired from the Edmund Rice Centre. Um, yeah, my question is, I suppose, directed at one of the big things that we've been trying to do over many years is to get Australia to take a stronger stand on climate change and to listen more and work more in real partnership with the Pacific. Any hints? No. <laughs> no, I, I mean, yeah, there's a whole engagement in rhetoric. I know that. But, you know, as much as our, our, our Pacific Island countries uh, want to take the stand, and as a former Australian High Commissioner to Fiji would say, sock it to us, James. But <laughs> the reality is that Pacific Island countries are desperate. They're in an economic crisis. They're in a development crisis. They don't have enough bridges, water supply, electricity. Uh, and so that's driving us as well in the, in the decisions we're making and in the silence we sometimes keep. You know, Fiji's prime minister, your good friend, uh, went pro Fukushima. And we know that every time the Fukushima conversation was coming up, even in the, 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 the years beforehand, China would show up with money. We need the funds. You know? So until there is equity in that area of climate uh, finance and those things, we're going to be stuck in this space. And at the end of the day, as my wife often reminds me, the people in the communities don't care where the money comes from. They need, the, they need the things that they need, and they need people to provide it, and they expect their government to provide it, regardless of where they go to get that money. So that's our challenge. I think we have room for one question, one more question if there is one from the floor. But if not, ah. Better be gentle. Uh, it's not a question, I'm sorry, it's not a question. I just want to thank you uh, wholeheartedly. It's such a courageous message. 
I thank you for taking up the challenge of giving substance to Turanga Prime Minister's um, utterances of calling for peace. You know, personally, when I heard him speak, knowing these things, you know, the hypocrisy, the hypocrisy that I, personally, that I perceived, it just sounded like a soundbite, you know? It just sounded like an easy way out. And I'm so grateful to you for bringing it back to us as individuals. Because so many Pacific Islanders are bombarded by so many weighty matters. Geopolitics, family breakdown, urban drift, so many things. And we're all, it's at a point now where, you know, like every discussion is like a policy discussion. And we're all, all of a sudden, policy experts talking about, Sanger, I love, I really loved your message, Padre. So, so personal, so honest, you know, just acknowledging love. He's, you know, Turangana PM has called for peace. Your admonition to be the peace, to embody the love, to demonstrate consistently the grace is so empowering. And I really look forward to tomorrow. Can I just make one more I uh, remember when we were in high school together, he was uh, more cheekier. <laughs> Uh, just, just one last thought to leave with you. The Sea of Islands is not just important because it was Ipeli's work. The Sea of Islands was important because it was needed at that time. It was a concept that was needed at that time and continues to be so. And that's what I want to challenge with the ocean of peace. We can reduce it to who says it, but for me, it's a thing that we need right now. And despite, or regardless, or whatever you want to say about whoever came up with the concept, it's something that we can use. And that's why I want to, if we articulate it in this way, we take control of the narrative and it doesn't become just another militarized uh, kind of concept. Naka. What a, a wonderful way to end this year's 2024 Epeli Hawa lecture. Uh, ironically, you know, it was a conquistador, I think, who looked over the, mm. the Andes, saw the Pacific Ocean and called it, well, the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> <laughs> one of the most turbulent oceans in the world. Um, and the Ocean of Peace is a, is a resounding restatement of that in a very, very different way, from a very different perspective. And I thank you for that, okay. James. It, it is just such a pleasure to have had you here. But I will now ask Katerina Tewa to give the final thanks on behalf of the AAPS and from myself at the Edmund Rice Centre. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Alopi. Um, I think actually Opeta said it uh, best, and I don't want to repeat his beautiful, heartfelt words, but I do want to say that um, in uh, Reverend James' really humble way, after we invited him to give the 2024 uh, Apele Hao Ofa lecture, he tried to nominate others that he thought would be better to deliver the lecture. And a few of us behind the scenes were saying, no, we would like to have this lecture from you because you are the right person to give this lecture. Um, as someone who knew Apelli really well, <laughs> I knew Apelli so well, um, he would have absolutely loved that. And he would have absolutely agreed with everything. And I think he would have absolutely been here for the ocean of peace, which I think, you know, as everyone's articulated, we need now more than ever, not just in our ocean, but in every ocean, 
as they say, from mm -hmm. the river to the sea, this really, really important, um, powerful um, call to embody the love and to embody the peace. So on behalf of um, the Australian Association for Pacific Studies and the Edmund Rice Center and the Australian Museum, where we are trying to make some of those collaborations that I think you are challenging us to do. Um, and I think this was one small step on the part of us academics to you know, do the right thing and be more inclusive and work with our colleagues and our friends and definitely our schoolmates, because we went to <laughs> school in Fiji at the same time as well. Um, we thank you, Vinaka Vakalevu Kopasin Rapa, for your powerful, um, challenging, beautiful, kind, inspiring words tonight. And we have very small, humble gifts, which um, we also were weighing up in terms of your travel plans. Um, but one of them is made from 12 recycled plastic bottles. So I thought um, the Reverend would absolutely love that. Um, one is the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, one is something that um, I think you will appreciate that um, Alopi uh, managed to procure called Next Goal Wins, and so hopefully it's uh, the Pacific Ocean of Peace <laughs> is the Next Goal Wins, and a few other small things which are from our heart, um, um, because I don't think, uh, you know, we can fully uh, embody in material ways uh, how much your beautiful lecture has meant to us. Mark. Very, very powerful Mark. annual how of lecture. Vinaka, vinaka. Rapa. And so with that, uh, we come to the end of the official proceedings. And so if you'd like to make your way out, there's an opportunity to have a bit more to eat if you didn't have meat, some soft drinks, and also just a chance to talk, network, and uh, reflect on what was a wonderful, wonderful speech. So thank you again from all of us, James. <laughs>